NASA Jet Propulsion Laboratory where the project uh, was born. And, but we all collaborate in, in, uh, from different data centers and institutions. So the people that you see here is uh, the one that should be credited, but I'm presenting part of the work that we did. Uh, and of course, the Venn diagram is like Jupiter and this science. Uh, and that's my GitHub handle and Twitter handle. So the talk topics are going to be really straightforward. Um, why it's live is relevant and how NASA built the data, how we deliver the data in a short demo, if time, sal time allows. Um, the acronym, which is a long acronym, it's Intermission Time Series of Land, Ice, Velocity, and Elevation. What you see there, it's the velocity of movement of glaciers in the Himalayas, Himalayas in India. Um, when you map at global scale, and in um, years, glaciers and other earth systems, don't, they're not static. They move. And, and you can see uh, in time lapses how they move and how they interact. So there are currently many things that we care about climate change, uh, as I said. Uh, we care about plastic in the oceans. We care about pollution. But uh, for some reason, one of the things that we care is like cities disappearing in the coast, right? Uh, that's kind of like an urgent thing <laughs> uh, for a lot of, most of the human population is for good reasons close to the coast. And one answer that is not like, you cannot say, well, in a hundred years, uh, Miami is going to be underwater or like any major city that it's near to, uh, by the ocean. Uh, so, some of the key variables for forecasting that with accuracy are like how these big land um, ice masses are going to uh, respond to the warming planet. And I'm already explaining, right, why, <laughs> why this is important. I don't know if you have seen that movie, uh, but it's an analogy of climate change. It's called, uh, what is it called, the movie? Yeah, look up, right? <laughs> um, and, and, and in that case, it's <laughs> oh, don't look up, yes. In that case, it's, a, it's a, an asteroid that is going to crash into the planet. And the analogy or allegory is that it's, it's climate change, right? Like nobody pays attention, and, and you know, if you have seen the movie, it's a good one. It's on Netflix. Uh, that graph that they're looking up is the carbon dioxide, which is totally correlated with the temperature of the planet, but it's not from the last 10 years. It's a million years based on ice cores, which some of them are studied at our, our data center. And there is something wrong with the last part of it, which also you've seen this in uh, um, multiple, you know, uh, presentations from scientists. I think it's called the hockey shape curve or something like that, where it just logarithm exponentially, yeah, goes up. Stick, yeah. <laughs> um, so yeah, and he's the PI, Alex Garner. And, and, and the, the main, as I said, the main cause of uncertainty for, for, um, for predicting how the land masses will move or respond to the planet is this. So at this scale, you cannot just go and put a pole in the glaciers and, and that with a GPS and see. Well, first, because we want to measure back from like whatever we can, right? So we, we, we have estimations from the past, but at this scale, only since we have satellites orbiting the, the planet. Um, and that is the mid 70s. So, that animation from Mark Fanestock, another of the scientists uh, on the project, shows you how a glacier moves through time. And if you have seen near, uh, if you have been near a glacier, you see the scale of this thing. This is like the size of, I don't know, the size of Paris probably. Um, <coughs> And this is in Alaska. So uh, we need to have a proper measurement of these kind of things. And with satellite, that's possible, finally, because you know we, we cover a global scale, and, we, and, and, and they have been continually measuring the planet since the mid-70s. Now, there is a problem. There are plenty of them. I don't know if uh, you had to work with satellite data from like the 70s, but they don't come in like nicely formatted ASCII files. 
Uh, and the new ones are overly complicated. So you have like very obscure uh, data from 20 years ago and very obscure data from this year. So <laughs> no win-win scenario here. Uh, and this is where the overlap starts, uh, right? Uh, all of this data is currently hosted at AWS because NASA is uh, on a push to put all the data in the cloud and AWS won the contract for that. Uh, so all the data from the NASA Earth Science missions is going to be is moving to the cloud. M most, of, most of the important or relevant data is already there in AWS. It will be in S3 buckets. Uh, so those satellites uh, produce data that it's already in AWS or it was ingested, but it's in, a, in their native format. So that's, that's problem number one. Um, if you're a scientist and you want to do like a time series for these kind of things, it's really complicated because the things that I just mentioned, like archaic data from formats that nobody knows how to work with to formats that are really too complex now, like we never learned the lesson. Um, and this is kind of like the, one of the products that the project uh, produces, and it's a, a mosaic of the speed of the glacier. So this is a Landsat scene, but uh, it overlaps with other Landsat scenes, and you can, like, uh, thanks to an algorithm that is called Autoriff, do uh, sub um, meter, not sub pixel resolution, because the, the commercial satellites, unfortunately, they're not like spy satellites that have like you know two meter resolutions for obvious reasons, uh, and then they're coarse in their resolution, so it's uh, 240 and 120. Uh, you have to work with that if you want to go like you kind of like have to interpolate to simplify things uh, to get more resolution for for these kind of things. And the data set it's produced since the 85, uh, well, since 85 to present, and, and it's distributed in these many different formats, which is great. Now, there is a problem. It's a lot of data. I'm taking this from Brian Abernathy from the Pangeo project. Uh, I really like this uh, um, diagram, where you see like no, the typical approach for scientists and for all of us, mostly, is to go to a website and download something and work with that something in our environment locally. But when that something that you're talking about is terabytes or a petabyte of data, you cannot fit that in your laptop. So there is another approach, which is like, let's put some web services on top of the data, and you do queries, and uh, there is some sort of data lake or data service that you can like, you know, query and get like filter data for, for that. That's, that's better. And it's a cloud approach where everything happens where the data lives. And that's what uh, the science world is moving towards to. And hopefully, uh, that will also enable open science, because if it runs there, it should run for everybody, not it's just in my machine, right? Um, so we have these elements, and this is where the project kind of brings all, all that together, uh, Jupiter, Pangeo, and the NASA scientists. <coughs> Uh, to produce something that the scientists can use in a very easy way. So the first thing you build is a website, right? Because that's what we do. Um, we build a website. You can like select your area of interest, and it gives you back. This is an API. If you want to call the API, you can also. Uh, it gives you back a set of URLs where, say, you're just interested in that region in Greenland. Um, you get your files back, your NetCDF. But in this world, I mean, in 2023, what normally scientists do with those files? They want to integrate it, to harmonize it, to apply it to their analysis. So it's not like they're going to just use, this, use them as is. Uh, and um, I think it's a, a great thing that the PI decided to go a step further with the project and not just deliver the, the granules or the file. Uh, granules is how NASA called the, the individual files. but. Um, and we, we went a little uh, further and, and say, well, let's harmonize the data, put it in a way that the scientists are going to use it uh, in the less you know, um, difficult way possible. So the first thing is like, oh, seems like uh, some of the scientists are moving to the Jupyter world and the computational notebooks. So let's provide some tutorials about what you do with the, with the files once they, they're in your, in your laptop if you are doing regional analysis. Uh, that's not for like, you know, I want to analyze and do a global 
uh, analysis. But for regional analysis, and, and you have PhDs that do a PhD on a glacier, uh, on a particular glacier, um, so then you have tutorials, and, and we provide notebooks to work with the APIs and to work with uh, the data so they can easily visualize. And this is thanks to the Jupyter ecosystem in the Pangea world, where you can have like four, five lines of code, and boom, here is your, uh, you're visualizing the speed of that glacier right there. But that's not enough. Uh, hence comes the cloud data formats that are like um, optimized for partial access. Uh, you, traditionally, these big binary files uh, pack a lot of information and metadata inside, and they compress it in one big tarball, if you will. Now, if you want to get some bits out of that, you have to basically download the whole thing. And what if you download a gigabyte and you just want like 10 bytes of that? Well, bad luck. You have to download one gigabyte. But with cloud native formats, uh, they put the metadata aside, and then you don't have to do that kind of uh, lookup in the whole thing. You can go and have random access directly in the data. Uh, we're using a, a file system that is called SAR, uh, that is widely used now for not just geosciences, but I think even Google uses it for the LLMs that are like the thing now. Um, some of the data is stored in, uh, in SAR cubes. Um, and the other thing that we did is colliding the data, so it's for time series, it's easier. Data chunking is something that we don't think much, but um, for this kind of analysis, it's a little bit like the analogy will be like in big data, you have uh, tabular data and you have columnar data. For time series, you want it columnar because the data is continuous. And if you do tabular, you have to access each point in time. It's an access to disk or to a file, and that will take forever. So we, we chunk the data in a way that it's easy for them to do time series, which is what actually they, they, they care about, how this evolved through time. And the last thing, and this is a little bit of a contribution back to the ecosystem, is like in, in um, the professional world, you have like really polished tools like Google Earth Engine, and you have like QGIS, or well, QGIS is open source, but uh, you have things in, uh, that are not in the Jupyter world that are really cool at doing uh, you know, GIS map analytics and that kind of stuff. But in Jupyter, you have basically, for the most part, the map projection that Google has and the layers that Google has. Because for most applications, it's like the, the taxi uh, example, right, in New York, you don't need anything for that. It's just like visualizing New York and, and the projection works. But when you're working with this kind of data and it's in the polls, you'll see like green length this size and uh, that doesn't work. Uh, it's better to, to have it uh, in a way that scientists understand, a beautiful map. Uh, and thanks to Tyler Sutherleaf at the University of Washington that he also contributed back to the project. <clears throat> we have, um, well, final notes on this. Um, I don't think there are like thousands and thousands of scientists that need to use this, but that's why we were able to leverage the uh, dashboard ecosystem because it will be a different world if, if this was like a, a TikTok app, right? Like it cannot handle concurrency for a million users. But there are not a million cryoscientists in, in the planet. So for the user base, we're using dashboards uh, and the tech stack, it's Bola base and, and uh, Jupyter and Pangeo, the packages that I mentioned. Uh, so that's why we can do what we did. And uh, let's see. If I can do a quick demo. So here is the, 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 the widget in my Jupyter environment. This is deployed. They don't see the code. They don't see, you know, they don't care about this um, for good reasons. Um, you see, what you see here in Greenland is the velocity, as I said, where the glaciers are moving. Uh, and the project is velocity and elevation, right? So with that, they can do this forecasting more accurately about like how many gigatons of water have been dumped into the ocean and, and have a better idea of sea level rise. So this is uh, Jacob's Haven Glacier, and I'm going to zoom in. In Greenland, that's a glacier that has been speeding up, and I think it's slowed down in the last couple of years. But you see, when you see these colors, it's bad. Um, 
So I'm going to click here. I'm going to click here. They can, uh, I'm doing it manually. They can upload their points of interest in a CSV format as well. Uh, and I'm going to plot that. So I'm touching a lot of data with those three points. Wait a second. And the plot itself won't take a lot of time. I think it takes like a couple seconds or something like that, depending on how many. But you see tendencies. And, and, and in this case, because I'm using it in the, in the lab, you don't see the graph like really nicely, but you can like, ah. You can resize it, and you can even download it. And it's uh, ready for publication. Uh, so you've seen this in, I think even the New York Times, uh, some of this. Data they of course didn't use this because they like nice graphics, so they reformatted the data and put it in like a nice, a nicer way. Uh, but you see the speeds of these three different points that I that I click on the map, uh, and that is the data like right. I think next month we're going to release all the version two of the data back to the 80s, so we have a complete. Oh yeah, yeah. I, I just need like uh, the last thing. Uh, so the last thing is that if you go to Antarctica and this projection is really not nice. So you can change the projection here. <clears throat> and you see a beautiful map of Antarctica projected in the right polar projection. See? Um, and this is a Jupyter notebook. So I'm not using QGIS. I'm not using, um, you know, uh, Google Maps or Googler engine, you can go here, uh, use this iPad leaflet uh, package that David Brochard and others at Quantstack have been maintaining and we've been using. Uh, it's amazing, but nobody knows that you can use like these kind of projections and mapping in, in, in a notebook. So you can, if you want, build a dashboard with a map application in Jupyter with a, and deploy with Voila we're having to touch you know, JavaScript or, or third-party apps. In this case, we're, we're taking the layers from Esri because they, they host better layers than other services. But yeah, so then you click here, and you do the same analysis, and you get the same plot. And at the end, they can export that into like CSV files or a NetCDF. But it's a synthesized version of all that big data that they, we had to process first from the 70s to today. And I think that's very relevant for all of us, the, this kind of um, uh, projects. And with that, I, I say thank you for coming. Um, yeah, questions. <laughs> I think we're in time, right? Perfect. Thank you very much, Luis. Uh, so basically, you, you're exposing a lot of uh, very great data this way, and also um, process data, for example, the, the flow of glaciers, that's a process data from the satellites. And if you would like to explore more data processed in a different way, is there a way to kind of replicate bits of this? Because it's a very nice way to explore the, this data, but there are always new ways to... Pro yeah, this can be modularized, in, and it doesn't have to be this kind of data. We can have a widget that just like talks to APIs and gets your data visualized in this projection with these layers. That's totally doable. So it can be the couple. They're not, you know, necessarily tied to the to the to the kind of data. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, so I will pass the microphone for anyone who would like to ask a question. Yes. So very nice. Uh, I have a question about the ZAR uh, files. Yeah. Um, can you say something more about the way those ZAR files are structured? Yeah. And, and the way that you query those R files. And would it be possible, for instance, to, um, it's a to, great question. to have a zip uh, st uh, store uh, format? Yeah. OK. I, this is a great question. And I thank you for doing that, because I forgot. <laughs> well, there are many things to cover in, in, in the talk that I didn't. Uh, but one of the things is that because the data was harmonized and it's in SAR format, we are not querying a data service, uh, uh, a web service. We're just querying the data with the map with Vola. So we don't have to have like a web service that is going to do some like transformations to the data because of the same thing. So SAR is, uh, I think it's a started, it started with uh, um, a scientist in, in Cambridge that wanted to pack a lot of data from genes into 
HDF files and run into the same issues. So SAR solves the problem by dividing the variables into arrays that are like, you know, inside directories. So, uh, and, and the metadata is in JSON files, so outside of the data. You can have different compressions on the different variables, and it's a very nice way to access the data in the cloud. Uh, it's, a, it's a great package. It's not only used for this. Uh, so I hope that that kind of like, yeah, you can have different kind of uh, filters in the data, and without SAR, this wouldn't be possible because of, you know, the, the partial access on, on, on the time series and all that. Yeah. How would you say this kind of open source solution compares to, for example, uh, Google Earth Engine? Well, um, we all have money. <laughs> and, um, but, I mean, for this kind of niche application, I think we don't have anything to envy from them because like, we have all the, the layers that we want, the mapping uh, in the right projections. Google Earth Engine is great because they have a cohesive experience for the user in, and, and, and they have like, you know, the data, they do the same thing. They harmonize the data so the scientists don't have to worry about it. A little bit like the uh, planetary computer from Microsoft. Uh, that, that's the trick, the getting the data in the right format so you don't have to wrestle with the data. Uh, this processing pipeline is not as an advanced kind of pipeline as the one that Google or Engine will probably has. No? Uh, every time that there is a mistake, and right now, for example, there is a satellite that produced some bad data, and it was caught after we reprocessed the data, so now we have to run it again, but that's a person that has to do it. And, and yeah, it is not in the sense of like polish, it's not as polished UX. But I think it delivers a very good experience, a bang for the buck, I would say. Um, and being open source, of course, we, we prefer it. Oh, if there, there are multiple <laughs> resolutions for the data. Um, currently, no. We only have the 120 meter per pixel resolution. Uh, so we don't, we don't have like a coarser resolution on the data, but we might have. If there is money, there is currently a recompete to see if the project continues for another four years. Uh, and if that happens, there are other great things that will probably come. And uh, this is a great project because it's one of the first projects NASA adopts these technologies. And it's kind of a, a, a pain <laughs> to adopt anything if you don't sign like a 24 pages, you know, uh, form for anything that a government institution does. So hopefully in the future we can have like. Uh, multiple resolutions and and not just uh, another thing that we were missing probably is like this running completely like in in the browser with uh, Pi PyLight, um, Jupyter Light. So then you don't need a server. It's just a bundle, and the data is in the right format in SAR, and and the only cost for the project will be hosting the data and some egress. Yeah. Uh, a catalog, like a stack catalog for all your data? Yeah, um, I think the, the, that's another great thing. Um, I, I, I missed the last slide, the thank you. <laughs> Let me go back to that one. Uh, I think I close it here. Um, yeah, I forgot. <laughs> I was in the demo and I was like, ah, there is one missing. Um, so the stack catalog isn't coming soon, yeah. <laughs> and the other thing that I mentioned, and uh, okay, so these are the photos of the scientists that are like involved in the project, and that's the URL if you wanna go and check more uh, of the project. It's, it's live, jpl.nasa.gov. Thank you very much.